Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and I want to start by thanking Tim, Roger, and the other folks at, at Cato for having this event, for giving us an opportunity to talk about, I think, this very interesting and timely subject. I um, also want to thank uh, my co-counsel, Alan and Bob. Um, it was, it's been a wild ride. And uh, actually, one of our plaintiffs, George Lyon, is here in the front row. So thanks to George also. If there's anybody, other plaintiffs I haven't seen, let me know. All right. Um, I also want to thank uh, both the people in the audience here with us today, but also people who are not here with us today, whose um, scholarship and their tenacious commitment to um, the principles underlying the Second Amendment really helped to create the uh, necessary legal framework um, and the legal environment that's necessary for us to be able to, to litigate and win the Heller case. Um, it's important, and I want to really kind of emphasize this in my part of the talk, um, really to understand how incredibly uh, key that scholarship was, both in transforming um, the legal environment surrounding the Second Amendment and making possible um, a victory in the Supreme Court. Um, on March 16, 1975, three women Carolyn Warren, um, Joan Telefaro, and Miriam Douglas were attacked in their home in Northwest Washington, DC. The details of the attack are horrendous. I will spare you the details. Um, they were raped and attacked over a period of many hours. Um, at the beginning of the attack, only one, one, one of the women had been attacked. The two others were upstairs in the, in the house where they lived. And they managed to call the police. They called the DC police and reported a, a break-in in progress. The uh, call was, dispatch was misdispatched. It should have gone out as a code one, indicating um, the highest level of, you know, of urgency. It went out as a code two. The police responded. The women upstairs saw the police cars drive by the building. One of the officers, in violation of uh, department protocol, went to the door and simply knocked and then walked away when it wasn't answered. No one went to the back door. If they had, they would have seen that it had been kicked in. Presumably, they might have done something different. The police officers left. Hmm. They were called back by the two women who could still hear the sounds of the attack going on below. The dispatcher was advised that nothing had been done. The police had not responded properly. This time, the call wasn't even dispatched. It was just written down as a sort of investigated leisure. The women then sued the District of Columbia for negligence because of their obviously negligent police response. And in court, at right around the same time, the District of Columbia enacted and began enforcing its gun ban the District of Columbia's lawyers took the position that the district had no legal duty to provide police protection to these women or anybody else. So think about that for a moment. At the exact same time that the District of Columbia is depriving these people, including women who are vulnerable to attack, of any ability to defend themselves from these kind of predators, they are also taking the position in the court that they have no legal duty to provide any defense themselves. I think that tells you a lot about government. I think that tells you a lot about the District of Columbia, unfortunately. If you knew a person, if you knew an individual who took that position, you would consider that person to be dishonorable and despicable, that they would deprive people of the ability to meaningfully defend themselves at the same time they disclaimed any duty to provide that protection themselves. That was um, the state of affairs. That was the, the story on the ground here in DC at the time we decided to bring the Heller case. What I want to focus on in the, my remaining uh, time is three points. Um, first. Why was it possible to bring the Heller case at the time we did? Why did Alan and Bob and I decide that it was the right time to bring the Heller case? And why DC? I'll start with the last question because it's the easiest in some ways. The simple answer is because the District of Columbia's gun law represented the most substantial and widespread disarmament of Americans on American soil since the time of the founding since the British disarmed the colonists at Boston. It was, bar none, the most draconian gun law in the entire country. It completely forbade private citizens from owning handguns, and it permitted, theoretically, the ownership of a long gun, a shotgun or a rifle. But it had to be unloaded and either disassembled at trigger, uh, and, or trigger locked at all times. And there was no exception for self-defense. So in effect, what DC allowed you to do is to have a club that looked like a gun. <laughs> so. That made, and, and the other uh, part of the equation for DC was that the District of Columbia Circuit, the Federal Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia, was one of the few circuit courts that had not yet weighed in on the question of whether the Second Amendment protects an individual right to own a gun. By that point, nine of the 11 uh, geographic federal circuits had uh, weighed in and said no. So the District of Columbia Circuit, I'm sorry, 12 federal circuits, uh, District of Columbia was one of the few where it was still an open question. 
What made the, the uh, Heller case possible at this time is something I've alluded to already, and that is the, the, uh, essentially the rise of pro-Second Amendment legal scholarship, of legal scholarship that found that the Second Amendment protects an individual right to own guns. Up until about 1983, when Don Cates uh, published a seminal article in the Michigan Law Review, the prevailing interpretation of the Second Amendment was that it protects a collective right to own guns. Uh, I was a Russian major, so I have some familiarity with collective rights. For those of you who don't, um, they are meaningless. It is a euphemism <laughs> for the absence of any right. Um, but this was the prevailing view, both in the courts um, and in legal academia. Uh, but as I said, that changed, and it changed rapidly um, as the sort of the floodgates for legal scholarship opened up, and people began taking a serious look at the meaning of the Second Amendment. Um, the nine circuit court opinions that I mentioned a moment ago, if you go and look at them, they are remarkable primarily for their utter lack of any significant or meaningful legal analysis. All they do is cite a single four and a half page Supreme Court opinion from 1939, United States v. Miller, that I described in the article Tim mentioned as a legal Rorschach test. It really tells us nothing about the meaning of the Second Amendment. Um, and there's no holding even in the case because they remanded it um, to the trial court to make some further evidentiary findings. And then the case was mooted somewhat ironically by the death, uh, the shooting death of one of the defendants in the case. Um, and the other defendant uh, took a plea bargain. Anyway, the um, uh, further point to make about the academic scholarship, and I really think this is where our opponents um, maybe suffered the most, is when a number of leading liberal academics took the position that the Second Amendment protects an individual right. Uh, Sanford Levinson, in a famous 1989 Law Review article in Yale Law Journal called The Embarrassing Second Amendment, describes how he started out to write an article about how the Second Amendment doesn't really mean anything. He was going to try to affirm the collective rights scholarship, and then discovered to his chagrin that when you take an honest look at the question, or at least that's what his position was when he took a candid look at it, he said there's only one conclusion you can reach, and the Second Amendment protects an individual right to own guns. Uh, this was followed by Lawrence Tribe, a very prominent liberal professor at Harvard, who actually rewrote uh, the portion of his uh, constitutional textbook in 2000 to change his view and say that, in fact, the Second Amendment does protect an individual right in his view. Uh, and they were not alone. So it became impossible, really, at that point to say that the only people who accept the individual rights interpretation of the Second Amendment are shills for the NRA and gun-owning gun nuts. Um, you had these very prominent liberal academics who said, no, uh, the fact of the matter is it does protect an individual right. The, um, the catalyzing event, um, what actually made it the right time, in our view, to bring the Heller case was a 2001 decision from the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, which not coincidentally, I think, covers Texas, Louisiana, and Mississippi, uh, being the first federal court of appeals to find that the Second Amendment protects an individual right to own a gun in a case called the United States v. Emerson. Um, what happened, there were two things that happened as a result of the Emerson case. First, it created a circuit split. Uh, this is a term of art that constitutional lawyers use to describe when federal courts of appeals have disagreed with each other on an important issue of constitutional law, and that generally puts an issue uh, on a short track to the U.S. Supreme Court. The other thing that happened in the wake of Emerson was that criminal defense attorneys all over the country began filing Second Amendment defenses to gun charges in cases where they would not otherwise have, do, uh, have done so. So we got a sudden raft of Second Amendment litigation. And this, um, basically, when we saw that, uh, my uh, uh, colleague Steve Simpson and I um, at the Institute for Justice looked at that and said, look, this, this issue is going to the Supreme Court. And it's going there pretty soon. The only question is, should it go up in the guise of a criminal case? Basically, where somebody's saying, well, I, I had a right to the gun that I used to carjack that guy. I probably shouldn't have carjacked him. But I definitely had a right to the gun uh, that I used to do it. Um, that wouldn't, those are bad facts. So we decided that, that a much uh, better approach would be to try to put together um, a, a classic civil rights case um, to vindicate the Second Amendment. And as Tim mentioned, Bob and I spent, and Gene Healy actually here at, at Cato, spent the summer of 2002 looking for uh, plaintiffs to be a part of this challenge. And as those of you who are familiar with public interest litigation know, and and this goes back, really, back to the day of um, the, the, the civil rights litigation in the 50s. Um, you try to work incrementally, and you try to put a human face on your case. And we were very successful in doing that, um, in large measure because of the, the excellent plaintiffs that we were able to recruit. Um, I'll tell you a quick story about one of them who's familiar to some of you, Tom Palmer. Um, Tom was a, a senior vice president here at the Cato Institute when we brought the case. Tom is also openly gay. 
and he was almost murdered by a skinhead mob in California. Uh, they chased after him and a companion and threatened them, and, and it's chilling. If you read Tom's affidavit, which we filed in the case, he relates how they were yelling at him, faggot, we'll kill you, and we'll bury the body where no one will ever find it. Um, Tom was able to uh, pull out a gun that he had in his backpack. He pointed it at the leader of this skinhead mob, and uh, this is not the moment where you would think there'd be humor in the story, but there is. Um, the leader of the skinhead mob immediately stepped back and said, hey, man, have you got a license for that thing? <laughs> um, Tom did not because it was California, and the only people who get licenses to carry in California are celebrities. True story, by the way. Sylvester Stallone has one. You can find his application online. Um, but Tom didn't have a license. Um, but he, he told me, he's dead serious. You know, if you take another step towards me, I'll shoot and I'll kill you. And they, it saved his life. He believes it saved his life. Um, interesting epilogue to the story. Tom had that gun, even though it was illegal, because his mother gave it to him. His mother gave him the gun because she said, Tom, if you're going to be openly gay, you will probably need this one day. She was right. So the fact of the matter is there are people in the world whose last resort is a gun. It's the only way they're going to protect themselves and save their lives against the kind of violence that the women faced who I described at the beginning of the talk or that Tom Palmer faced that night um, in Long Beach, California. So Tom and uh, uh, the remaining plaintiffs and Bob and Alan and I set out to vindicate this right. Um, I'll skip, o skip over the procedural uh, history of the Heller case, even though it's very interesting, and um, complete my, my remarks by describing very briefly the uh, three opinions that the Heller decision produced. Uh, the first was Justice Scalia's majority for five justices in which he um, took a very careful, painstaking look at the relevant history and text, answered essentially all of the arguments that have been deployed against an individual rights interpretation of the Second Amendment, including the idea that it only protects uh, the authority of states to field and arm militia. Uh, I think uh, systematically demolished them. Um, injected a very unfortunate bit of dicta, which we'll probably hear about later, in which he said that, that despite the fact that a total gun ban is unconstitutional, of course, no one's questioning the ability of the government to um, ban guns in sensitive places and to ban guns that are dangerous and unusual and so forth and so on. Um, but on the whole, a solid opinion. Could have been better, but every Supreme Court decision could have been better. But the, the, what counts is what the holding was, which is that the government cannot ban completely um, a commonly used weapon like a handgun for self-defense. Um, I have to actually quote from the Stevens dissent because every time I read this sentence, it just boggles my mind. Justice Stevens essentially adopted without acknowledging that he was doing so. Uh, he essentially adopted the collective rights model. And he says, this is his, uh, from the second paragraph of his dissent. The question presented by this case is not whether the Second Amendment protects a collective right or an individual right. Surely it protects a right that can be enforced by individuals. The Second Amendment plainly does not protect the right to use a gun to rob a bank. It is equally clear that it does encompass the right to use weapons for certain military purposes. What? So according to Justice Stevens, the point of the Second Amendment is to enable people who are engaged in military operations to assert an individual right in court to be armed while they do so. One has the image of Marines storming a beach, you know, with broomsticks. But, but one of them thinks, you know what? We could go to court and get an injunction and, you, and, and, and have guns for this operation. And that's really the point of the Second Amendment. It is ludicrous. It is a ludicrous interpretation of the Second Amendment. Um, and perhaps for that reason, there was a second dissent in the case uh, written by Justice Breyer. All four dissenting justices, by the way, signed on to both dissents. The dissent that said the Second Amendment effectively means nothing or that's rather comical, right, uh, to have a gun while engaged in military operations. Justice, Steve, uh, Justice Breyer did what you might expect from Justice Breyer, which was to create an elaborate balancing test that always yields the same answer, which is that the government can do whatever it wants in this area. Um, I skimmed it again. It's not really worth relating to you. you those of you familiar with Justice Breyer already know it anyway. Um, but essentially what he did is he sort of looks at the government's interest on one side, which is, of course, saving lives. Um, and he looks at the interest on the other side, which is, of course, uh, the ability of people who don't work in the most heavily armed facility in, in Washington, D.C., like Justice Breyer does, um, to protect themselves when they're at work or at home. And Justice Stevens, uh, I'm sorry, Justice Breyer essentially finds this to not be a terribly important right. Um, I sort of wonder if he might change his mind about that, by the way, if they took away armed security from the Supreme Court, might focus his attention. Mm -hmm. um, some of you may know Justice Breyer was robbed at Machete Point on the island of Nevis in the Caribbean a couple of years ago, um, and his home was broken into in Georgetown. So um, perhaps if those things had happened before the Heller case, we might have had a different perspective. Um, I'll just end by saying that um, the uh, 
Supreme Court's analysis of the issue in Heller um, really, I think, transcends the issue of guns. It goes to the very heart of one of the most important questions in all of constitutional law, and that is, what are the prerogatives of the individual in society? When you, when you leave the state of nature and you go into a society with government, do you leave behind the effective ability to protect yourself from violence when the state cannot? That, to me, is what this question comes down to. And people who support the Heller dissent say that you do effectively give up any meaningful ability to protect yourself from violence when the state either cannot or will not or disclaims any legal duty to do so. Those of us who support the Second Amendment, those of us who support the individual rights interpretation of the Second Amendment reject that view. You do not give up your right to defend yourself from violence just because you live in civil society or, as the case might be, an uncivil society. Thank you.